This is Fred DePiro. This video is on the data sandbox that I've been developing as part of the Engage project. We're going to be using it to study student success. Engage is an NSF project uh, with Jane Lear as principal investigator. It involves Hancock, Cuesta, and Cal Poly. Now, the purpose of this video is to reintroduce the sandbox to the engaged team members and a great takeaway would be suggestions, questions, comments, and so forth. Uh, an ASWE draft paper is in preparation. Uh, it talks about the sandbox more. So what is this thing, the sandbox? Well, basically it's a web application uh, that integrates together student data, um, what I would call career long data, uh, that is information that doesn't change throughout the student's um, time, say at Cal Poly, uh, incoming GPA, incoming major, application data in general. Uh, so that stuff. Term data, term by term, uh, term GPA, total units taken, um, and so forth. Uh, course information, so all course grades, including the term they were taken. And ultimately, this will involve data from uh, all three institutions. So that's the first part of it for the sandbox, student database. Second part, the R statistics package. Third part, which I'm on the cusp of uh, getting into, is a data, data mining tool called Weka. This is most certainly a work in progress. Why has a sandbox been created? Well, it's primarily to uh, focus on evaluation efforts on the Engage project. Um, we'll be investigating student progress for various cohorts and uh, also within subgroups within those cohorts, Latinx, first gen, female students, for example. Also, we'll be using the PSM method, that's propensity score matching, uh, to match student participants uh, with non-participants. So student participants, that is students that are in Engage, receiving the scholarships, and non-participants that we'll draw from historical records. We'll be comparing success between these two groups. Uh, that'll include benchmarks and metrics like involving coursework, retention rates, progress to transfer at uh, the community college, transfer rates, progress to degree, and graduation rates. Now, what kind of invest investigations are possible with uh, this tool? Well, uh, we can explore various success metri metrics, as mentioned. Uh, we can examine various subgroups, as described. Uh, also, we can look at uh, a variety of kinds of questions, uh, and these are a little bit broader uh, than Engage, but also have a lot of overlaps as well. Uh, for example, uh, do our transfer flowcharts make any sense at all? Do they really reflect uh, uh, in a realistic way the uh, progress to degree? Um, are students really marching along those flowcharts the way they're printed? Likely not. Uh, how impactful are these various bottleneck areas and where are those bottleneck areas? Uh, how disruptive to progress are things that occur towards the end of their uh, degree at Cal Poly, like internships? Um, what are the typical entry points into the curricula for transfer students? We don't really know this. Um, what uh, factors predict uh, success or non-retention? for especially for transfers. What fraction of the transfer students are part-time? This is something I've stumbled upon recently and I'm very interested in it. I, I think it could have a significant impact. And I'm wondering also, can part-time status uh, that we see in the historical records, <clears throat> can that be used as a proxy for uh, uh, gauging the financial hardship uh, that a student is experiencing? This would give us a way to um, estimate uh, the financial hardship for all these thousands of students that we have access to in the archival data. It's pretty interesting. Um, so that this is a, this is an, another area of investigation. 
and also curious about things like uh, what impact on degree progress uh, might, uh, uh, how degree progress might be affected due to repeat courses or changes in major. So lots of issues with progress to degree. All right. Um, so in the sandbox, uh, it's been designed to promote uh, collaboration and best practices. Hey, none of us on the team is an expert in statistics, simultaneously an expert in statistics, in uh, social science research, and a programmer. Okay, we don't have one person that wears all three of those hats. So we need to be able to work together on this thing and share results. And the design of the uh, sandbox is intended to do this and also to promote best practices. So you'll see this dem uh, uh, as I demonstrate in just a minute here, uh, the idea of sharing what I refer to as an investigation. Investigation is just a query with related documentation. So we can, each of us can do those, run those investigations, define them ourselves, and then share them uh, with others. And so I can go in and copy someone else's investigation and then run it and muck around with it and change it and so forth. And so this is a little bit beyond saying, hey, hey, check this out. Look what I found. Uh, it goes a little beyond that because, yes, we can do that, but also uh, you can then try that. Uh, particular investigation yourself. So more than just look what I find, but also try it yourself. And the investigations include a, uh, they sort of guide you through a, uh, the way they're structured, guide you through a fill in the blank uh, type of uh, approach to document uh, various aspects of uh, the study, hypothesis, conclusion, and so forth. They include a summary report, uh, which uh, dumps out all of the uh, fill in the blank information together with the results of the statistical analysis into a PDF that can be shared uh, with no uh, privacy concerns there. It's all just summary data, no student identifiers. In fact, uh, there are no, uh, all in student identifiers are encrypted within the sandbox. That was part of our um, approval process uh, from a data security perspective. Uh, so documentation is also included, or it'll be developed more, but that includes a uh, data dictionary, uh, the IRB approvals, data security uh, approvals, and uh, there are also uh, guidance is provided within the system to interpret the various, res uh, various results that are produced by R and in the near term, WICA, the data mining tool as well. Like how do you interpret a t-test? How do you interpret a correlation uh, test and, and so forth? Okay, so with no, no further ado, uh, here's what the screen looks like when you log in to the sandbox. Uh, there'll be some information down here about uh, goals and everything, introductory. Here's a link to the appropriate use agreement. Log in here, click there. Each of you will have a uh, password. Uh, for future expansion, uh, we might have different projects in the future. For now, it's just engage. Okay, and here we can pick a particular investigation. Just have a few in here so far. You see the owner uh, over here on the left. So I own uh, these two. Now Buck, that's my dog, uh, he owns these two investigations down here. And uh, you can see that I, I can't click on those because they're owned by Buck but I can copy them by clicking on this button. I click on that, give the uh, investigation my own name, then I can run it. I can also duplicate the ones I have. Okay, so we'll start on this one. This is, has to do with uh, success measures, looking at GPA uh, out in the fourth term of attendance. Okay, so here we're gonna, we're able to uh, define and run an investigation. And this stuff you see on the right in the green blocks, uh, this is, these are the uh, fill in the blank aspects. So here's an overview, uh, the theme, the goals, some, maybe some uh, background information on why this particular study might be useful. Here's a short name uh, for it. Uh, here are some, uh, an area where you can fill in more specific goals, uh, hypotheses, questions, and so forth. Uh, here is a takeaway section. Uh, 
Okay, so these are all fill in the blank, uh, just you know, filled in by a particular user. Now come down here to where we define subsamples. Uh, subsample is a term that I use. Uh, it's synonymous with a subgroup out of the uh, larger uh, data sample uh, that we have uh, that comes from the uh, archival repositories. And uh, so here we can go in and we can establish the criteria uh, for a subsample. Depending on the type of analysis you might be doing, there might be one or two or more uh, subsamples. Another aspect of this, uh, uh, that is criteria for subsamples, like I might have one criteria for transfers, another criteria to pull out a first time freshman, for example, if I was gonna do a comparison between those two groups. Pull out males and females, for example, for your two subsamples. Um, the next uh, major section that I have here associated with subsamples are the data fields or properties associated with each of the students that are in a given subsample. So we'll look at these next. So here's my criteria for uh, my subsample. In this case, I'm doing correlation. I just need one subsample. I called it transfers, and here it is. Uh, so now, right away, I should say these fields the names that appear here are going to be improved. I have a mechanism through the data dictionary to uh, make those a little more friendly and readable. That's just, I haven't gotten to that yet. Uh, but here's when the student came in. It's in 2015. Uh, they were first enrolled. NTR stands for, as a trans, stands for transfer student. Uh, so first enrolled as a transfer student. That Y means yes. Uh, enrolled as a first-time freshman. No. Uh, not the why. Uh, he, incoming college when they uh, first were admitted is 52 College of Engineering. Now, uh, in these uh, areas on the right, 52 will be changed to a drop down and it'll have a nice polite name like engineering instead of the numeric value. Uh, these yes, no things will also have drop downs. Similarly here, because uh, we just have a, a set of, you know, fixed set of years, that'll be a drop down and what as well. And uh, here I have these uh, various drop downs for comparison and categorical um, criteria. So these four criteria are combined using and logic. So the student must have come in in 2015 and uh, they came in as a uh, transfer student, not as a first as a freshman. And uh, that, having both of these just makes it easy to switch between the two groups. And they had to come in in engineering. That's how these are read. And the, like I say, this will be um, improved a bit, make a little bit more uh, readable. Here's where I name the, uh, uh, this group. I can save any changes. I can add more criteria and drop criteria in order to establish the subsample. Okay, so I set up that subsample. Then there we go, we're done. Uh, so coming down here, we have our subsample set up. In this case, it's going to pull transfers from 2015. Now, what data do we want to see for those transfers? Click on that. And I, I grabbed a bunch here because I was, you know, looking at a, a number of different things. Uh, what you're seeing here is um, uh, on the left, like this is a higher ed GPA after uh, the fourth term. And on the right, uh, what you see is a all too brief uh, data dictionary entry. Uh, this is going to be changed, so there'll just be a button here and then a, a window will pop up uh, that gives the data dictionary entry because those are gonna get a lot longer. So this is really insufficient the way you see it here. But you can pull in any number of different fields uh, out of the um, uh, total data that we have. Here's a count of uh, terms on the Dean's List, for example. So if you want to see uh, what that might look like, uh, you can, well, you can add or take away any of those fields. Like maybe I decide I don't want, uh, you know, I want to change this. So uh, just so you can see some of the different fields I have ready for you. Dean's List, okay, they're grouped. There are a lot of them here. I have admissions data like incoming GPA. I have initial conditions like first time freshman, initial major term they came in, the college they came into. Then I have uh, degree information. Did they, um, were they a participant in a post baccalaureate program? Did they get a degree? 
um, undergrad degree, grad degree, when did they get it, what was the final major, final GPA, honors information, minors information, yada, yada, yada. Uh, demographics, uh, race and ethnicity code, uh, gender code, EOP eligible, that has to do with economic hardship. Um, some other criteria that are in the application, again, all these names and data definitions are going to improve, but uh, did they, how much did they work before they applied? Uh, extracurricular uh, information. Did they, when they had a job, was it related to the major? Are they a veteran? Uh, parents' education level, maximum between mother and father, also mother and father individually. Okay, information on prior institution for first-time freshmen. Was it a was it a partner school? Uh, what type of school was it? A uh, community college or a high school? Last school? Uh, so we can pick out all the uh, transfer students from Cuesta or from Hancock or either or and so on. Um, let me see what else we have here. Other uh, extracurricular stuff that was in the application. Now here's some term information. So above all this, I would I refer to as curricular, or I'm sorry, um, uh, career type information. This doesn't change over the student's entire career at Cal Poly. For example, what was their incoming major? That's not, that's information that isn't ever going to change. Now, down here in this next stage, section, I have uh, term by term information. And um, it's set up rather simplistically now, but it's just to kind of get things moving. For And so I'm focusing a little bit on their progress to degree after four terms of enrollment, four, eight, and 12 terms of enrollment, just to kind of see how those trends go. This can be uh, made more general to any number of terms. How long did they persist? Uh, total units that they accumulated that were graded, um, grade points after various terms, higher ed GPA, uh, count of terms on dean's list, count of terms on academic probation, percentage full load of all terms attending. That's really got my interest. I'm very curious about that. Uh, Cal Poly GPA uh, for students in good standing. So this is suggesting a bit of filtering that's going on in the data. Uh, and also after four, eight, 12 terms. Um, and uh, something I'm working towards in the future is pulling in all of the course data. So for example, uh, grade in a particular course the first time they took it, the last time they took it, average overall times they took it. Um, term, uh, when did they take a particular course for the first time? When did they take it for the last time? And, uh, and this term rank is a count of the number of terms. Did they take it their first term, their second term, their 10th term, and so forth. Uh, so uh, working on the course data is uh, something that's uh, in the near term working on. Okay, so these are all different um, fields that you can draw from. And at this point, I honestly forgot uh, what I was working on when I came here. Um, but uh, so I'll just uh, grab anything here like uh, mentor GPA. I think I have that in here twice now. Okay, all right, so you can go in here and you can pick out all the different data fields that you wanna have associated with all the students in your sample. Muck around with those and we'll say done. Now, uh, this particular um, investigation that I'm doing is looking at success me measures and it's a correlation. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to configure uh, the correlation test. That's the type of analysis that's being done here. I have my uh, subsample set up, my subgroup. I have a bunch of data fields available. For my correlation, though, I only need two of those data fields. So what I'm going to do here when I configure the correlation test is just to pick two of those. So here I use GPA versus GPA. It's the incoming GPA, and here are all the other data fields that I had uh, just identified. So I have the incoming GPA, and then I have the Cal Poly GPA uh, in the fourth term of attendance for students in good standing. So I, I pick two of those, update them, and here we go. Okay. Um, one other thing I have here, I'll just show you real quick. This is another fill in the blank item, but it's a way that I wanted to, um, I, wanted, I wanted to set this up to facilitate sharing 
uh, of our different investigations. It's a ranking. Uh, so uh, here I just I have this one tagged as, uh, hey, any feedback would be helpful. Uh, but uh, there's, I think there's some other rankings in here that'd be useful. Like, do you find a result you think is publishable? Uh, one that is surprising, one that is not helpful, something that's simply unclear, uh, a mistake or an error that you want me to look at. Um, flagging that this is just a work in progress, <laughs> leave this alone. Okay. And, uh, these are using these as, as a way that we'll be able to search through each other's investigations. Um, uh, instead of just searching by the, uh, owner, uh, we could sort of search by this ranking or status. Okay. All right. So, uh, great. We're all set up here to do this correlation. Let's run it. Boom. Okay. There, it just ran. Now, uh, let me just take you through this and show you, lead you through this here. Uh, I have a summary report that I'll show you momentarily. And this top section here is uh, w something that the uh, owner of the investigation can enter in. This is another fill in the blank. This is based on the results that appear below. What do you think about all this? Sort of a user summary. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Uh, so here is a plot. Now this was generated by R. Uh, so here you're going to start seeing results from R being pulled into the web page and displayed to the user and integrated together with other information. Once again, field names to be improved. Uh, but here's that incoming GPA uh, on the application. Here's the GPA at Cal Poly for students in good standing after the fourth term. And uh, so in good standing, this would imply that they have a, better than a two point. And in addition to that, that they persisted for four terms. Okay. Um, so uh, here we could see, actually, it isn't too bad of a correlation. Let's see what we have here. Okay. So here is a description of uh, the analysis that was done and the results from R. Uh, so I have this uh, text up here uh, that is intended to describe uh, the analysis done by R, the various steps that are done, and also uh, how to interpret the results. For example, uh, a correlation coefficient of 0.3 is considered to be maybe moderate. Correlation coefficient of 0.5 or larger uh, is thought to represent a relatively strong or large correlation. Uh, so we have that general information to help a user that is especially a user who isn't an expert in statistics like me, okay, help interpret those, the results from R. Uh, some notes on data size and filtering. If a student has uh, some blank or null values, which do occur here and there through the data set, then typically those students are going to have to be kicked out of the uh, subsample. So uh, let's see what we have here. In this case, here's a summary. Uh, one student was dropped due to missing data. No students had zero values. Eight students were dropped due to negative data values. In this case, that's because the students did not persist for four terms. Uh, final number of students was 158. Uh, this is uh, transfer students in the College of Engineering that came in in 2015. Initially, they were 167. Okay, so some notes on exactly the conditions that were used to drop students out of the subsample and how many were dropped. Uh, a summary of data definitions to be improved, and then the raw output from R. Uh, so uh, testing, oh, one of the first steps in correlation is test for normality. It's a particular method that's used. In this case, uh, the two uh, the uh, X and Y sets of data pass the normality test, which means that we can use pre Pearson's method uh, for bivariate normal variables. And what we see here, son of a gun, is a correlation that is a hair under 0.5. Uh, that's a pretty strong correlation. Okay, So that's saying that the uh, incoming GPA is a decent predictor for uh, GPA after the fourth term, uh, the Cal Poly cumulative GPA after the fourth term. And so that's what I have up at the top here. Results from the Pearson method yielded a correlation estimate of just under 0.5. Uh, this level of correlation is at the border of what would be considered a strong correlation. Hence, the incoming GPA appears to be a good predictor of GPA up through the fourth term. 
Okay. Uh, another uh, cute little feature that I rather like is this uh, ability to print a summary. So this way we can, you know, not only share within the data sandbox, but we can also share uh, using the a PDF that summarizes everything I just showed you and something that we can share more broadly outside, the, you know, uh, uh, just the team that's going to be logging in. So titles, dates, plots, figures, um, background. So this text was all just taken uh, right off of my fill in the blank information. And uh, then it's also interspersed with, um, let's see, some of the uh, uh, information that I have, uh, the generic information for a uh, correlation test. That's in this section here. Uh, that sort of reminder. Uh, a data overview. Um, uh, that includes, um, that font's a little funky there, uh, includes uh, the various um, criteria that were used to pull out the subsample, to identify the subsample, that report on how many students were dropped and why they were, um, data definitions, acknowledgements, notes. Okay, so uh, that might be handy for us for uh, sharing our work. And um, yeah, so there you see the result of uh, something that uh, was generated by R. I'll go back here. And I think that's everything I was going to show you uh, with this particular investigation. Uh, here is another one uh, that involves a t-test. I'll just show you that uh, briefly. Bring that up. Same kind of fill in the blank stuff. Now with a t-test, we're going to have two different uh, subgroups or subsamples. Uh, one subgroup, uh, for example, here I had transfer students and another subgroup, first time freshmen, FTF. Then uh, for each of those two subsamples, we're going to pull out or, or I, so have uh, available to us various um, uh, data, pieces of data uh, that describe those uh, uh, subsamples. Uh, so let's see here, kind of similar to all the stuff I had in the uh, other case. In this case, I was real interested in the percent uh, full load. And let me show you why. Um, uh, so uh, let me see here, configuration. Oh yeah, so uh, right here is where I select the particular performance variable that I want to look at in between those two uh, subsample populations. So I'm going to look at percentage full, uh, full load. Okay, we'll run this, and uh, here are the results from R. Uh, transfers in blue, first time freshman in red. I'm not too pleased with this histogram plotted by R, but anyway, uh, it sure looks like the transfers are slid over a bit noticeably. The uh, difference in the means uh, was significant, as reported by R. And the difference in those percentages was about 5%. Uh, so interesting uh, that it was, the difference was significant. I'm very curious about, uh, th this makes me want to ask more questions. Uh, so here up at the summary, I have, uh, yes, it was significant. It was 5%. I'm curious now, I think we need to look at this more closely. Uh, I'm curious, when do the part-time terms occur? For example, are they near the end of a student's effort at Cal Poly? Are they spread through and through? Um, uh, also, uh, are, are there just a, you know, a smaller, you know, a subset of, uh, say, transfer students that are responsible for contributing to this mean of part-time uh, status? Or is that spread through and through across all the uh, transfer students? So I'm kind of curious about that distribution uh, among different students and when they're taking, they're taking on the part-time status. Um, so I'm kind of, uh, this is, this is opening some new questions and I, I'm very curious about this. Okay. So I flagged this one as a surprising result and uh, something I want to, I want to check out more. All right. Um, let's see. I think that pretty much ends the tour and uh, let me start wrapping up here. Some next steps for me, we have the ASE draft, ASWE draft in just a, a few days. I need to add in more cohorts of data, 
pull in, uh, do a regression analysis, should be straightforward based on uh, what I have so far. Uh, PSM uh, is on the Horizon 2. Uh, fill out my data definitions and then after all that start looking to uh, week of the data mining tool. Um, now compared to some prior efforts done by an IE master's student, Katie Steidel, uh, we have some new uh, kinds of data available to us now. In particular, the term by term progress data uh, in terms of units and GPA, like I was showing you, also uh, course grades and not only uh, the grade they got, but also when they took a particular course. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, for example, uh, how many times did they take a course? How many times was it repeated? How closely uh, was it to the flowchart? Uh, did they take it way off the flowchart, which would skew their progress to degree? Where are the bottlenecks in the flowchart? Um, when does progress to degree begin slipping? Uh, this could be useful information at the program level, for example. Uh, so we have new information compared to what Katie did. Also, uh, well, in addition to that, this, this percentage pro, uh, full time status. Really curious about this because I'm wondering if we can use that as a proxy uh, or an indication for students uh, that come from a low income uh, family uh, that are fa fi uh, facing financial hardships. Very curious about this uh, because if so, then uh, if, if a percentage of uh, full-time status can be, uh, if we can infer uh, the uh, financial hardship from that, then we have a lot of uh, indicators of, uh, of uh, financial hardship over years of data university-wide. This is a big deal because um, the financial uh, status of students is very, very closely guarded uh, by federal law. We don't have access to that. So if percent part time is an indicator of financial hardship, this is a treasure trove in that area of um, uh, 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 financial hardship for years of uh, students university wide. I'm also really wondering how much the uh, uh, part time status skews. You know, it's, I think it's just going to skew progress so much and it is more prevalent among the transfers. Some of our study for some of our studies, we may just want to focus on, say, full time or say 90 percent full time or something like that. Um, so this is this is new and pretty interesting to me. Uh, also, um, and this gets towards the uh, PSM uh, uh, efforts uh, that are part of the evaluation as well. Some prior studies that were done uh, maybe uh, 10 years ago or so uh, by the uh, fellow who used to run Cal Poly IR, uh, he, he saw a correlation between uh, MEP membership and student success. Uh, I don't have the details on what he did, uh, but uh, MEP is our multicultural engineering program in uh, College of Engineering, with, and it has a substantial uh, membership. Um, like they put out, they don't, they put out uh, invites to upwards of probably, um, well, well over 500 students a year. Uh, that doesn't mean we have that many active members uh, in it, but it's a big organization. And uh, there is a documentation in the past, or we know it has been documented in the past, that there is a correlation between MEP membership and student success. I want to repeat these studies and investigate them further. And um, to do that, uh, I've uh, requested email addresses for the MEP officers in recent years. So I think of those officers as sort of exemplars, uh, people who are really in the uh, deeply engaged in the uh, MEP experience. So I'm thinking if any MEP student, you know, uh, would have benefited. Uh, from their uh, from their experience with the group, surely the officers would have. There's a good bet. Okay, so we'll get those students and we'll tag them in the database. And then what I want to do is to try doing the PSM matching between the MEP officers, uh, comparing them. So MEP is like the treatment. Uh, the MEP officers versus other students with comparable demographics. So we'll match based on demographics. 
who knows, maybe part-time status, maybe GPA, maybe many other factors that we have available to us. We'll do that matching. MEP is the treatment. We'll see how the MEP officers do compared to the other students. Um, and so then if we kind of, let's think optimistically, like I usually do, uh, suppose we find something there where MEP is like the treatment and we're seeing, uh, we get PSM working and uh, we're seeing the benefit of pairs of students between MEP officers and other students. Well, now we can use that same uh, code and same approach to see how the engaged participation uh, compares. And I wonder, uh, see, in terms of um, thinking about, um, you know, how this, uh, the efforts from the Engage project could uh, move forward in, in perpetuity, you know, um, it, uh, on campus. You know, if we could uh, find out things like, uh, you know, how does um, Engage participation in, say, mentoring or some other aspect of Engage, uh, having certain um, strengths, perhaps, or something, you know, along these lines. How does uh, participation in Engage compare to uh, the benefit, uh, and I'll just use uh, the MEP officer involvement, for example, as, uh, you know, another uh, example of uh, a, a, a program, a support program that provides benefit. You know, so how are these, what are the relative benefits between these? You know, is having a mentor as beneficial as being an officer in MEP, for example? And uh, this kind of relative comparison between uh, support programs is important because uh, the, for example, the benefit of being in MEP and being an MEP officer, that's a limited resource. We only have so many slots that we can fill with students that are gonna flow into that. And it might not necessarily appeal to every student. So we wanna be able to look at the various support programs and you know, compare and say, you know, the you know these have a strong benefit, these have a lesser benefit, that type of thing. So I think this is a way we can kind of really uh, uh, gain some ground with our historical data using PSM. And I'm re I'm somewhat optimistic here, and I say that because, like uh, as I mentioned, the uh, there was a prior demonstration uh, this correlation between MEP membership and success. So we've got uh, we. we we can capture that, I think, and uh, uh, build from that. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you very much for your attention with this video. I'm sure I dragged on and on, and I apologize for that. But what you saw here uh, were some features of the uh, sandbox that allows us to share investigations. Uh, these investigations, as I call them, they include these fill in the blank sections uh, that sort of guide the user uh, through uh, the various uh, areas of uh, documentation. Uh, talk about hypothesis, conclusion, and so forth. Uh, you saw a summary report that'll be uh, convenient for sharing both in and outside the team. Uh, you see that there are some, although they're not complete yet, uh, there are uh, there's integrated documentation within uh, the system. Uh, data dictionary, uh, IRB and data security information, as well as guidance uh, to help users interpret uh, results associated with R and this other data mining tool that um, we'll be exploring as well. So I look forward to hearing uh, your reactions and suggestions. Comments are always welcome. And uh, thanks very much, everybody. All right, talk to you soon.